Hello, wonderful people. This is the official first episode of Cultivate. So this is pretty exciting, but it also could be terrible. So I'm warning you now. I've been wanting to do this for ages, but as always, just imposter syndrome and my silly little brain telling myself that I definitely can't start a podcast because it wouldn't be good enough. But hey, I absolutely won't know if I don't try and imposter syndrome can get in the bin. So this first episode is just me today. I want to talk a little bit about my story, share some of that with you, and basically tell you how I ended up here as someone with a dual career as a touring musician and a personal trainer and online coach. So as many of you will know, the way that I got here was a little bit weird and also really unexpected. If you had told me, you know, a year and a half ago that I would make a living from helping people feel happy in their own bodies and helping people enjoy their training, navigate things like body image issues, gender dysphoria, body dysmorphia, I honestly wouldn't have believed you. I feel so lucky and happy to do what I do. And it all was just a bit of a happy accident, I guess. It all started in the pandemic. So I was a full-time touring musician and illustrator And within a 10 minute phone call, I lost all of my touring work for the rest of the year, which was absolutely devastating. And I had always been a designer and an illustrator throughout being a touring musician because it was a really handy way to support myself. I could easily design or draw things while I was in bands or venues all over the world. So it was always really important for me to do something that could supplement the touring at that point. I went completely freelance as a touring musician and an illustrator in 2018, and it wasn't easy. I lived in Brighton for a lot of that time, and it felt impossible at the best of times. With the design and illustration, I felt like I went into that industry because it was something I could do. I fell into it completely by accident. I always loved art and drawing. I designed my own band's merch and album covers because we never had the budget to outsource that stuff to other people who would do a way better job of it. But I fell into that career by accident in 2015. And by 2018, I went full time with my bands, Cult Dreams and Nervous. And I did design and illustration on the side. And I think I did it because people kept telling me that I should. And I wouldn't say I was amazing at it, but I got it to a point where it could pay my bills. But I was not fulfilled and I wasn't happy. It was just a means to allow me to tour with my band. And as a result, what happened is that I didn't succeed at it very well as a self-employed person. It may have looked like I had at some point, but I would literally do anything to get paid. I would do random ad hoc touring, like drive bands around, sell merch, stuff like that, a little bit of tour managing. So I never really fully committed to it because it didn't feel right. So when COVID hit and the government was saying, you should retrain, you should retrain. And we were all saying, well, that's ridiculous. I actually ended up doing it but not because they told me to. It was because I had wanted to do this for ages. And once again, imposter syndrome just smacked me back down every time. And I just ran out of excuses to do it. And in hindsight, I wish I'd done it years ago, but hindsight's a wonderful thing. So here we are. So during that final year of the lockdowns we were in in the UK, I got my level two and level three personal training certifications. And by the time the lockdowns had eased up, I was then working out of a commercial gym, teaching spin classes, pump classes, uh, what else, legs, bums and tums, all that stuff that I would have found absolutely terrifying. But I'm really glad I did it. It was a huge challenge and it's got me to the place of where I am now. I am a touring musician, but I am also a full-time online coach and personal trainer for the LGBTQ and alternative communities, which is hugely fulfilling. It brings me so much joy and I love the people that I now work with. It's been a bit of a weird and wonderful journey and you might now be thinking, well, they were a designer. How did they even think about becoming a PT? What happened? So I'm going to give a little trigger warning now before I get into it. I am going to talk about eating disorders, body dysmorphia, self-harm, mentions of suicide. So if you've come to listen to this podcast 
today and you don't feel like your head's maybe in the best place to listen to any of these things I've mentioned, feel free to hit pause and come back to it another time. Okay, let's get into it. I was a 90s kid, so I very much grew up in a house with 90s exercise VHSs, Weight Watchers binders, some of you may remember the folders with all the recipes in, a product called Slim Fast, which literally lined the health aisles of the supermarkets in the 90s in all different forms. So I was born at a time where diet culture was at it finest it was thriving and it was the worst and a lot of you may relate to this as a young kid I was often put on a diet at a young age I grew up in a house where weight and body size were pretty prevalent and mentioned not through anybody's fault just because that was diet culture I was always a sporty kid. I used to play tennis. I went to this awesome little club in Hull where I got to play football, got to run, play like softball, a ton of tennis. It made me so, so happy. And I definitely felt not 100% right in my body from a young age. And I don't know why I didn't feel right, but at that point, I obviously didn't have the language to communicate about things like gender dysphoria or body dysmorphia. So by the time I reached a teenager, I had such a skewed view of my body. And when I look back now, I know that was dysmorphia and I know that was gender dysphoria. But at the time, I did not have that language. I was often told at school that I wasn't feminine enough or I wasn't skinny enough. I got told I looked like a man a lot and teased for body hair and often teased for being a tomboy as well. I never really resonated with wearing super feminine clothing, even as a young kid. And I think at the time, any adults in my life would have just put that down to me being sporty, but obviously it was a lot more than that. Anyway, by the time I was in college, leading all the way up to my like mid-20s, I was immersed in some really unhealthy behaviors that led me down a path of an eating disorder and some really, really bad body dysmorphia. Again, all this stuff stemming from unrecognized gender dysphoria, diet culture, misogyny, fat phobia, capitalism, the media. Honestly, it's wild and it makes me sad that not a huge amount has changed. But when we do zoom out and look at how it was in the 90s, There are definitely way more inclusive people at the forefront fighting all of this stuff in the mainstream media now, which we definitely didn't have back then. I think my relationship with exercise and food was always pretty troubled all through college. I would often like exercise purely out of guilt. The relationship between moving my body and eating was wildly, wildly skewed. And there would be a lot of things that I told myself I couldn't have, I couldn't do, I couldn't experience, I couldn't wear, all down to a lot of those disordered thoughts in my head and an eating disorder. And weirdly what I found in the years of kind of working on myself and opening that up a bit more, it's all hugely linked to the gender stuff. I would often dress really feminine despite the fact I hated it when I was at college because I wanted to be normal and I wanted to please the people around me. And when I dressed feminine, that seemed to work. So from a people-pleasing perspective, that was what I did. And that linked right into all of my behaviours behind closed doors with food and exercise. Again, through any of these points, I just didn't have the language to communicate or even understand or comprehend what was going on in my brain at that point. I just want it to be normal so badly. And it might be obvious to say that over the years, I put myself through a ton of trauma, self-harm, suicide attempts. I didn't really always know why I went down that path, but I just knew something wasn't right. And I would repeatedly do things to punish myself for that. So in 2019, I was eventually diagnosed with an eating disorder. And this was at a point where it was just all consuming me. Everything had just bubbled up and I felt the most unwell I ever had in my life. And that was at a point where both my bands were doing really well. 
it looked like on the surface my design career was going really well. I was in the gym every day. I was playing great festivals, great touring opportunities. And from the outside, I would forever get told, oh, it looks like you're killing it. It looks like you're killing it. But what was really happening is I was punishing myself anytime I ate. I would restrict to the point where I would end up in such bad bouts of binge eating after those super long periods of restriction. And then I would wake up at 6 a.m., force myself to walk to the gym, train for an hour and a half and walk back. I would follow a lot of fitness influencers that were completely toxic. And I didn't think they were toxic at the time. I just thought that was how it had to be. And this wasn't even that long ago. This was all going on between about 2017 to 2019. So this is fairly recent when we think about it. But I found all these fitness influencers who I thought that I should be like. If I want to be a person that trains and that has this aesthetically pleasing appearance and body, this is who I need to be like. And these were all straight, female, cisgender fitness influencers. I was never going to be like them, no matter how hard I try. And that was just constantly eating me up because they were always the goal. And no matter what I did, I couldn't get there. And at the time, I didn't realize how bad this had got. And it took that eating disorder diagnosis to make me question so much of that. And it didn't all come at once either. I feel like over a good two, three years, I was slowly picking apart all these behaviors that I thought were totally normal for someone and actually realizing that everything that I was doing to myself was hugely detrimental and I was really, really unwell. It took me like three years to recover from all of that and get everything into a place where I felt like I was in control of myself again. I had therapy and I also listened to a huge amount of podcasts by inclusive health professionals, lots of health at every size creators, lots of fat activists, lots of people in the fitness space that were not those cis white female fitness influencers that were preaching a lot of disordered behavior on their various channels. Now, this isn't me saying that every straight cis fitness influencer is problematic because they're absolutely not. But all the ones I seemed to dig out were, and the ones that the algorithm sent my way absolutely were. And if I came across them now, or if I knew one of the clients that I coach was consuming their content and it was making them feel as bad as it was making me feel, I would be hugely concerned and I would instantly recommend a ton of other content creators that would bring so much more joy and used inclusive and way more healthy practices. I was basically put on a list to go to an eating disorder clinic and it was an NHS waiting list. But I really, really needed the help then. So I left it about six months and heard nothing. And then I found a low income therapist that absolutely changed my life. They specialized in eating disorders, depression, anxiety, and it gave me the space to work through absolutely everything. And it might have been that the ED clinic was great for dealing with the eating disorder side of things. But I definitely realized that what I needed more than anything was that therapy and to do my own work outside of that. And I was finally putting myself first for the first time, which I had never done. And I worked super relentlessly on my own well-being at that point. And I say this with a huge amount of privilege because I was a freelance designer and musician. So I was in charge of my own schedule a lot of the time. And being on tour with all of this swirling around my head constantly was so hard. It felt absolutely impossible sometimes. However, if I hadn't have had the privilege of being self-employed and freelance, I wouldn't have had access to this low-income therapist that I went to in the middle of a weekday once a week, you know? So I'm so, so grateful for that. So with the help of that therapy, me doing all my own self-discovery, discovering inclusive fitness content, reading about eating disorder recovery, doing all of that, exploring all of that in my own way, I got to a point after a few years where I was so much more balanced and neutral towards things like food, body image and exercise. There was so much more balance there and I still moved my body at that point because I enjoyed it. I lifted weights and I ran and I ate well because I felt good, but I also wasn't doing that hard restriction. So it took 
years for that to land. And obviously, if, if I had been able to afford a coach, then that probably would have happened super quick. But I truly believe I probably needed all that time to get there myself as well. So as soon as I felt like I was at that point where I was in eating disorder recovery, a lot of my gender issues came up. And it was almost like I cleared this little space in my head. And then all of my kind of unaddressed gender issues were like, oh, hey, we're going to move into that space. Thanks a lot. But that was actually easier to work through coming out of ED recovery because I finally had a ton of clarity with that stuff. And I was also really starting to see the link between everything. So after going down that gender rabbit hole internally and in therapy, I came out as non-binary. I lived as a non-binary person within my immediate circles, within my music industry circles and my friend circles. But I came out to family as trans a lot later. And then I had top surgery in September last year, which has probably been one of the best things I have ever done for myself. I honestly couldn't be happier since I had it done. Despite what they say, gender affirming healthcare absolutely saves lives, which is not the rhetoric we're hearing in the mainstream press at the moment. So that's a little bit about my story. And I hope that sharing a bit of my story can help the people listening understand how I got here and why I do what I do now and why it's so important to me. A lot of the time now, I am striving to be that help and representation that I was absolutely desperate for through some of the toughest periods of my life and I just didn't feel like I could find it. I was always looking for more queer non-binary representation in the fitness and health spaces and I could barely find anyone. So of course the second I expressed this I was often just told well you go and do it then and obviously that is not ever as easy as anyone makes out. But I am finally here and I do feel like I've made a bit of a dent of that in the last year. And I'm super, super excited to make more of this stuff for you all. Getting to this point has felt like just the biggest, most mentally challenging climb I've ever had to do. But I am at a point where I absolutely love my dual career. I love making music. I love running Fuzz Culture Club and Cultivate and helping people in a way that's free from toxic diet culture, toxic fitness culture. And personally, I've finally reached that point where I live authentically and not to please other people. And I still often struggle with that day to day, don't get me wrong, but it has definitely been the most transformative three to six years of my life. I'll tell you that much. So that's a wrap on episode one, a little bit about me, where I came from, how I got here. I hope you all have an awesome day, whatever you're doing, wherever you are. As always, you can find me on Instagram and TikTok at Fars Culture Club. And if you want more information about working with me on my one-to-one coaching plan or joining my Cultivate group coaching program, just head to my website, fuzzcultureclub.com. I'm going to love you and leave you now. I'll see you in the next one.